Happy Monday, listeners. For Scientific American Science Quickly, this is Allison Partial filling in for Rachel Feltman. Let's kick off the week with a quick roundup of some of the latest science news. First, an update on that doomed Soviet-era spacecraft Rachel mentioned last week. After spending more than half a century orbiting Earth, the Cosmos 482 probe made a crash landing on May 10th. According to a post on the app Telegram from Russian space agency Roscosmos, the spacecraft crashed into the Indian Ocean somewhere west of Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia. Space.com reports that other space agencies have estimated different landing spots for the probe, from locations on land in South Asia to stretches of the eastern Pacific. We may never know exactly where Cosmos 482 finally came to rest, and in any case, we haven't heard any reports of falling space junk causing harm to humans, so it seems likely that the object crashed somewhere pretty out of the way. Now for some accidental alchemy. Despite the wishes of medieval scholars, there's no way to just turn lead into gold, right? Wrong. Physicists at the Large Hadron Collider apparently did just that. Very briefly, but still. The scientists published a description of this magical-sounding transformation earlier this month in the journal Physical Review C, and here's how it worked. Scientists at CERN used the Large Hadron Collider to study the early universe by firing lead nuclei at one another at nearly the speed of light. Instead of smashing head-on, the nuclei usually pass very close to one another, and in those near misses, the powerful electric field from one nucleus can shake up the other. If the field is strong enough, it can knock out three photons from an incoming lead nucleus. And since gold has three fewer protons than lead, this transforms the lead into gold. The researchers estimate that 89,000 gold nuclei are produced per second during these experiments. That means that between 2015 and 2018, the accelerator's second run, which is where the scientists collected this data, the collider produced 29 trillionths of a gram of gold. Unfortunately for any prospectors at CERN, these atoms tend to get obliterated in about a microsecond. Nature reports that another CERN accelerator also observed this alchemical reaction during a 2002 and 2004 run. But because that experiment used less energy, less gold was produced. Moving on to public health news, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data released last Wednesday indicates a massive drop in overdose deaths between 2023 and 2024. In the 45 years that the CDC has collected this equivalent data, the biggest one-year dip seen previously was 4% in 2018, according to the Associated Press. Deaths dropped from about 110,000 in 2023 to roughly 80,000 in 2024, which represents a 27% decrease. The AP reports that experts mentioned several possible factors behind the drop, including the increased availability of naloxone for treating overdoses. It's important to note that while this is promising news, we still have a really long way to go. Overdose deaths are still higher than they were before the COVID pandemic, and overdose remains the leading cause of death for people in the U.S. between the ages of 18 and 44. If you don't already carry naloxone with you in case you encounter someone experiencing an overdose, consider looking into what resources your state and county offer for training and distribution. You can check out getnaloxonenow.org to find out more information. We'll wrap up with a couple of fun animal stories. Let's start with flamingos. They're not exactly known for being very active. You're probably picturing the birds standing around calmly in crystal clear water on one leg. But according to a study published last Monday in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they're surprisingly busy just beneath the surface. Similar to the way that spiders use webs to trap prey, the study authors say, flamingos create little water tornadoes to coax food straight into their mouths. First, the birds use their feet to churn up sediment. Then they jerk their heads up, turning those small whorls of sediment into vortexes. Meanwhile, the animals chatter their beaks to create even more water movement, pulling the swirling sediment into their mouths. From there, the flamingos can filter out tiny prey, such as brine shrimp. But it seems like this filter feeding is a lot less passive than it looks. In other animal news, it turns out that chimps use leaves for everything from first aid to bathroom hygiene. In a study published Tuesday in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, researchers described their observations of two different communities of chimpanzees in Uganda. 
the researchers identified numerous instances of self-care using the leaves, from dabbing wounds to packing them with chewed up plant matter. The chimps sometimes offered their care to others too. That's similar to behavior other researchers reported last year in orangutans over in Indonesia. Orangutans have been seen applying juice made from saliva and the leaves of a plant with anti-inflammatory properties all over their bodies, which scientists suspect they might be doing to relieve joint and muscle pain. Plants seem to be part of a larger wellness routine for chimps, too. The scientists also saw them using leaves to clean themselves up after pooping or having sex. The researchers even described one instance of what they called, quote, pro-social post-coital penis wiping, end quote, which means one chimp lent another a hand with intimate personal hygiene. While these aren't the first documented cases of first aid in non-human animals, or even in chimps, which have been seen putting smashed insects in their wounds, possibly for medicinal purposes, scientists are excited to see evidence that medicinal plant use might be more widespread than expected among our close relatives. That could suggest that wound care goes way, way back in our evolutionary history. That's all for this week's News Roundup. Rachel will be back on Wednesday. Science Quickly is produced by Rachel Feltman, Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, Naima Marcy, and Jeff Delvisio. This episode was hosted by me, Allison Partial, and edited by Alex Sugiera. Shayna Posis and Aaron Shattuck fact-check our show. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Scientific American, this is Allison Partial. Have a great week.